very much for coming back after lunch. Uh, nice to see we haven't lost too many people. My name is Guy Jobbins. I'm a research fellow in the water policy team here at ODI, and I'll be chairing this session this afternoon. First up, we have Shilk Verma joining us from, uh, the, uh, from IMI, and he's going to be talking about the rise and fall of the groundwater irrigation economy. And then we have Richard Taylor from UCL, and then we'll be having a facilitated discussion with uh, Violet Alinda, uh, Steve Wiggins, Eva Ludi, and Bruce joining us as well. So, without further ado, um, I'd like to pass over to Shil. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, Robert, can we have the slides? Okay. Um, my name is Shilp. I, I work with IMI in India, and uh, I'm also with the UNESCO IHE, which is in Delft in Netherlands. Um, uh, the presentation I'm giving is basically on, on also on behalf of Tushar Shah, who I work with in IMI. Uh, the, the topic is, is very vast, and I'm going to try and cover as much of it as I can in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but basically, if, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll give a glimpse of the groundwater irrigation economy in India, how it has evolved into a colossal anarchy, its welfare and unfair impacts. Um, it has it has served uh, Indian irrigation to a large extent, but there have also been certain impacts which have been unfavorable. I'm also going to talk a bit about groundwater governance experiments uh, that have been tried in India. Uh, direct and indirect approaches, the nexus between electricity and groundwater irrigation, uh, attempts by farming communities to recharge uh, groundwater. Uh, if I have time, I will touch on some of the emerging issues on groundwater, uh, which are coming up largely because of solar irrigation becoming economically feasible. Um, and then in the end, I'm going to talk about why we are talking about groundwater irrigation in India in the context of sub-Saharan Africa, which I understand is the theme of the, the, the discussions all day. Um, are, there, are there synergies between what has happened in groundwater irrigation in India um, and whether there are mutual lessons to be learned between India and sub-Saharan Africa, as well as uh, from based on past experience, as well as going ahead in the future? Uh, yeah, and um, before I get into the slides, I've never done this kind of a presentation before. So if I goof up in a big way, just bear with me. Okay, can we have the next slide? Um, just to give a historical overview of how irrigation evolved in India, um, initially up to up to about 1830, we had only adaptive irrigation, riverine water was lifted from rivers and streams and uh, the areas along the river were irrigated next slide please yeah yeah the period between 1830 and 1970 was what we can call state control irrigation uh, the state first the the british state as well as the uh, Indian state, just after independence, invested heavily in large irrigation systems, dams and canal networks mostly, which were designed for full irrigation, which meant that the water from the entire river basin was collected in large reservoirs, and then that was used to service uh, a small command area, which was defined and serviced through canals. Next, please. Okay. Uh, but since the 1970s, what has happened is what can be called atomistic irrigation. Uh, there is still canal irrigation. India still has a large number of 
medium and large irrigation systems. But within as well as outside the command areas, ever since drilling technology uh, became cheap and the groundwater irrigation, farmers realized the value of groundwater irrigation. Irrigation has spread everywhere. Um, there is a lot of groundwater irrigation within command areas, which is obviously the groundwater is replenished through the recharge happening from canal irrigation. But even outside the command areas, overall, if you look at the entire uh, geographical mass of India, probably five or six percent is only serviced through canals for irrigation. But a lot of groundwater irrigation happens outside command areas. And that has been possible because of uh, the, the economic feasibility of drilling technology. Almost every remote village you will find drillers today. Uh, and this, what can be called a groundwater juggernaut, basically started developing in the 1970s. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this chart, India was almost nowhere in terms of you know, the, the total amount of groundwater withdrawal uh, per year. But since the 1960s and 19, especially since 1970, it has left behind all other countries. And today, India is by far the largest user of groundwater. Most of this groundwater use goes into irrigation. But there's also a lot of groundwater use for municipal and industrial users. Uh, I would say roughly 80% of this groundwater abstraction is for irrigation. Next, please. Um, and then it has spread all over the country. Like I said, it's not just in, in the command areas of canal systems, but it's all over. Each of these dots, the black dots represent 5,000 electric pumps. And each of the white dots uh, on the Indian map represent 5,000 diesel pumps. Uh, and all of these pumps, we have somewhere between 20 and 25 million uh, wells and tube wells or electric and diesel pumps. And all of these are used to lift groundwater. Uh, the spread of these is more in terms of the demand for irrigation and less in terms of availability. Um, in terms of water availability, Eastern India has by far the best aquifer systems in India. Um, it's floating on the world's largest aquifers. But because most of those villages are de-electrified, there is the electricity connectivity is not very good. Uh, farmers are forced to use diesel. Diesel is very, very expensive. And therefore, farmers under-irrigate. But in Western and Peninsular India, uh, there is a lot of groundwater irrigation, which is helped by uh, free or almost free electricity supplied by the government. Um, and most of Western and Peninsular India is also hard rock area. Um, so except for the northern part, which is Punjab, Haryana, uh, the parts near Delhi, uh, which are alluvial, most of Peninsular India is hard rock area. And that that is a completely different dynamics of groundwater irrigation. Next slide, please. So this is what we, we call a colossal anarchy. It's colossal because it's just the number of structures. If you look at it, 20 to 25 million, no other country or no other region of the world is anywhere close to that. Uh, in terms of total annual use, uh, it's twice of what you, the USA and China are using. But even more important is the fact that 55 to 60% of the population is dependent on that. And each structure extracts a very small amount, 9 to 10,000 cubic meters per year, uh, which means that it becomes even more difficult to manage this. If it was just maybe a few thousand large users uh, using groundwater all over the country, a, a central body or even state bodies could, could imagine controlling this abstraction directly. But because we have 25 million smallholder users spread across a continent-sized country, it's almost impossible to control them directly. We don't even know the exact numbers because till recently, the, the structures weren't even registered. Um, a few years back, uh, it was made mandatory to register every groundwater abstraction structure only in, in the capital city of Delhi. 
and even that has not been done uh, so you can imagine the, the the rural rural parts of the country we don't even know where exactly these structures are but uh, it contributes 10% to india's gdp it it services 70% of india's irrigated areas 70 to 80% of rural population is dependent on it and 60 to 70% of our farm output is dependent on it so groundwater is basically the the major source of irrigation in india and uh, it has played an important role in ensuring that irrigation is sustained uh, which means that a lot of livelihoods are sustained we still have more than 60% of our population dependent on agriculture and they would not have been able to earn a livelihood if it wasn't for groundwater next please yeah we can move on yeah so i'm going to talk about uh, some of the experiments in uh, groundwater governance that have been tried in india energy irrigation nexus is one of the things which emi in particular emi in india has been working on for the last 10 years uh, about a fourth of india's power goes into lifting water um, as i showed you all those millions of structures uh, the electric ones use power most of which is supplied free or at highly subsidized rates which means that um, on the one hand this is a big advantage for the farmers and the farmers very vehemently uh, support this kind of a subsidy that is given by the government um, but on the other hand it has made the electricity utilities almost bankrupt in state after state uh, because farmers use a large part of the electricity and they don't pay for it or they pay very little for it um, the utilities have gone bankrupt so this what this has meant is that the utilities in order to keep themselves out of the red they started reducing the power supply to rural areas so that not only affects farmers but it also affects the rural household consumers it also affects the rural industrial consumers um so it's basically led to a anarchy at the feeder level in in the rural areas now emi had been working on this problem since 2000 uh, 2001 and uh, we came up with a set of recommendations which basically the, the the broad argument was that because electricity utilities do not understand farmers as consumers that's why there is a rift and if they start understanding the need of farmers for electricity which is lastly for irrigation and they don't need irrigation for eight hours a day every day uh, if they can intelligently ration electricity supply to farmers then farmers would be happier and the electricity utilities will be happier so next slide so in in 2003 to 2004 uh, we made a lot of presentations to the government of gujarat which is gujarat is the state where the emi anand office is located where i am working um, and the government of Gujarat introduced a scheme called Jyotigram Yojana, which took into account most of the recommendations that EMI had made. The first thing they did was they rewired the entire rural landscape. Uh, they put tube wells on it on completely separate feeders and the domestic and non-farm customers on different feeders. They ensured 24-hour supply to the non-farm customers because they were willing to pay for for the electricity that they used and then they rationed uh, power to the agriculture users by giving them eight hours of uninterrupted high quality power uh, on a pre pre announced schedule so for 15 days uh, in a month they would get electricity from i don't know 12 12 noon to 8 pm and on another 15 days they would get it from 4 pm to 12 in the midnight but as long as the farmers knew beforehand uh, when electricity would be available, they could adjust their irrigation patterns to that. Next, please. So this, this diagram basically shows how the feeders were rewired uh, to make sure that the non-farm consumers, their destiny is separated from the farm consumers. Uh, apart from doing this, uh, they also introduced a lot of 
other reforms in the electricity sector. They unbundled the utility. They made small corporate entities out of them. Um, and they introduced a lot of uh, human resource reforms. So understanding that most of the people who work with the electricity utilities also come from farming backgrounds. And in most cases, even when they know uh, a particular farmer is defaulting on payments, they, they kind of sympathized with the farmers. So now, given that the electricity utility was uh, able to treat farmers as customers, uh, able to tell the farmers in advance when exactly they will get high quality power, uh, the electricity utility staff began to understand uh, the difference between you know their their farming origins and the, the jo job that they were doing in the utility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thanks largely to this Jyotirgram Yojana and also to a, a, a community-driven water harvesting and groundwater recharge movement in Gujarat. Even though Gujarat's agriculture, which is largely dependent on groundwater, is growing at 9% plus rate annually, Gujarat is the only state in the country where groundwater levels are actually coming up. In most other places, groundwater is depleting every year. The farmers have to deepen their wells. They have to go deeper and deeper to extract groundwater. But in Gujarat, because of the steps that the government of Gujarat has taken and because of uh, the water harvesting and groundwater recharge movement in Saurashtra, uh, groundwater governance seemed to be working somehow. Next, please. This is this is a small river basin in in Saurashtra, which is the peninsular part of Gujarat. This just shows the the drainage network and the th and the three uh, large state-owned uh, dams in the in the river basin. The whole area of the river basin is is less than 500 square kilometers. Next, please. And all the dots, or the tiny dots that you now see, uh, slide back, please. Yeah, so all the tiny dots that you see in the map now are tiny check dams, which the people themselves have created. So what these check dams do is basically they slow down the flow of water and enhance the recharge. Uh, we have a monsoon kind of climate. We get rainfall for about 100 days in a year. The rest of the year is dry. So. When these check dams store the water, they increase the amount of water that gets recharged, and therefore water is available in the wells for a much longer period. So in a small river basin of about 500 square kilometers, there are more than 1,000 such structures which the people have built themselves, uh, either through charitable organizations or quasi-religious groups, or in certain cases also with the support of, of the government of Gujarat. Uh, this is the way the, the farmers in Gujarat are actually reconfiguring the river basins. Uh, the river basins don't, um, don't allow all the water to flow to the large reservoirs anymore. The water is stopped um, in a large number of tiny structures and then make sure people don't directly lift from that structures and they make sure that the water is recharged and therefore whenever they need the water in the dry season, they can use it later on. Next, please. Okay, so different parts of India are in different stages of, of groundwater development, or as we can say, the rise and fall of groundwater socio-ecologies. Uh, the first phase of development is where the government actually in the 1960s and 70s had to convince the farmers to start using groundwater. They did that by doing public tube wells. Uh, and once the farmers got convinced, they quickly started making their own investments in, in groundwater irrigation, which led to the second phase, uh, which was the motor pump irrigation boom. Uh, a large number of private investment was made in, in all these millions of structures. Um, but most parts of India are now in phase three or phase four. 
phase three is when the externalities of overdevelopment started appearing. Uh, much of the groundwater started depleting, water levels started going down. And in phase four is from the ex examples in Gujarat that I just talked about, where people as well as the government have tried to overcome the negative externalities of overexploitation and have started finding innovative ways of managing uh, this, this resource. Uh, now, the reason why I'm talking about all these four stages is because, uh, I mean, here in the examples row, you can see different parts of the country. Uh, so phase one, Charkhand, which is tribal India, is still in the first phase. There is very little groundwater irrigation, whereas Saurashtra, which is in Gujarat, uh, is already in phase four. Now, there are parts of India which have gone through all of these four phases. And Sub-Saharan Africa is just beginning to get into the phase one. There is some groundwater irrigation. There have been studies about the huge potential of groundwater irrigation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there is also some fear that, uh, you know, unchecked groundwater irrigation negative externalities might become uh, a, a, a reality in Sub-Saharan Africa as well, much like they have ha that has happened in some parts of India as well as in US, Australia. Um, so next slide, please. So if you look at much of Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as roughly two thirds of the Indian landmass is hard rock aquifers. And next slide, please. Um, we can come back to this slide later. Can we go to the next slide? We did a survey, EMI did a survey in 2012 in nine sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, we talked to more than 1,500 farmers and we found that almost in every country there were pockets of pump irrigation boom. Uh, pump irrigators who were using water from groundwater wells, they reported the highest net value added per acre. They also reported the highest net value added per family worker. Uh, our we concluded that improve access to working capital, uh, to input and output markets, improving the security of land tenure, and providing affordable energy could significantly contribute to these pump irrigation po pockets basically growing further. Uh, <clears throat> even even where even where we talked to farmers who were not using pump irrigation. Pump irrigate, pumps were the, the kind of aspirational assets for these farmers. Uh, most of the manual irrigators were women, but even they were using manual pumps largely because they, they wanted to save on the uh, huge expenditure on petrol or diesel. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, just before that. Yeah. So South of Sub Saharan Africa is now embarking on the path that India has basically traversed over the past 50 years. Um, eventually, Sub Saharan Africa's groundwater economy will be driven by resource poor smallholder farmers, which is also the case in India. It will involve a sizable chunk of the local population because the economies are still largely agrarian and it will depend on complex hard rock aquifer systems. So peninsular India is probably the world's only large landmass which has gone through this experience. Everywhere else where we talk about groundwater irrigation, uh, whether it is Pakistan where most of the groundwater irrigation is in the canal command, so alluvial area, or North China Plains, again alluvial. Uh, most of the other places, the their experience will also be useful. But there is, I don't, I don't know of any other place where uh, hard rock aquifer systems have been exploited to the extent that they have been in peninsular India. So there are, I think there are certain things like the ones I talked about, the the importance of irrigation energy irrigation nexus, or 
the possible advantages of doing decentralized water harvesting and recharge. These could be some lessons that uh, the Indian experience can offer to Sub-Saharan Africa. But even more important than that is the fact that there are hundreds of mistakes that we've made in India over the past 50 years, which we now wish we hadn't. And I think Sub-Saharan Africa can learn from those mistakes so that they don't have to repeat the same mistakes as they as the groundwater economies in these countries grow. Yeah, that's all. Thank you very much indeed, Shilpa. Um, we're running uh, beh somewhat behind, so I'd like to move on to the next presentation, but I just want to check if anybody has burning questions for clarification. There'll be a chance to come back and uh, discuss the broader points in detail later, but if the, anybody's got any clarification points, now would be the time. Okay, so in that case, I'd like to invite Richard Taylor up to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me um, uh, to give a short presentation. Um, in fact, you can guess at this stage of the day that quite a few things that I was going to say have been, uh, have been said. Um, although I do have, uh, in, in a similar um, uh, uh, fashion, um, I was tasked with uh, trying to relate some of the experiences um, that we've uh, had in uh, South Asia to the situation in, um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, the, uh, I'll start by the, the slide that's in front of you. Um, uh, let me, here we are. Um, the slide in, in front of you is a kind of perspective that some people, not everyone in this room for instance, but some people have. When I've had uh, discussions with uh, people in government ministries in East Africa. Um, uh, this is often the kind of image that comes to mind where people are thinking about um, uh, intensive groundwater fed uh, irrigation. This is pivot irrigation of maize. Um, and this particular agricultural land that we're looking at in the picture happens to be sitting on top of a regional dolomite aquifer in Zambia, an incredibly uh, transmissive um, uh, aquifer system with quite high storage that sustains well yields well in excess of 10 liters per second to, to drive uh, pivot irrigation um, uh, like we see here. I, in fact, in discussing some of the experience in, uh, in, in South Asia, was going to um, highlight an, an extreme difference. And uh, Shilp Verma has given us a very good discussion of the hard rock conditions in Peninsular uh, India. And I was probably going to use a slightly more extreme example and refer again to the alluvial systems. And, um, I, and again, that's where I have uh, more experience. But um, I'm happy to uh, talk further about the hard rock systems there as well. But um, if we think about uh, agricultural regions such as in, uh, uh, within the alluvial aquifer systems within the uh, Gangetic Plain and in the Bengal Basin, um, these are thick, uncon unconsolidated alluvial aquifers. And I, I guess maybe I'll just point out, by the way, uh, to, to people in the room. Um, I'm a, a hydrogeologist at University College London. I look at, in, in many ways, uh, though I'm very uh, uh, open to the uh, social and political uh, dynamics of what's going on here, I'm very much someone who's couched in the physical sciences of what we're looking at. And uh, that in part will be, I believe, one of the reasons why I was asked to speak and, and, uh, and more to what I'll, I'll speak to. But just uh, in case people aren't aware, the importance of geology and climate in determining what may or may not be possible. And, and so when one looks at these alluvial systems um, with uh, uh, able to uh, produce uh, very high well yields uh, required for irrigation, and in many cases uh, uh, we're, uh, we're talking about um, very low cost, locally available uh, drilling uh, methods. So for instance, um, the, uh, uh, the bamboo rig that you see in the photo in, in, in front of you uh, um, 
uh, this is from Bangladesh actually, where uh, you're able to drill a, wells in Bangladesh wouldn't exceed a cost of 400 pounds and most of them would be in the order of 100 pounds. So we are talking about very, uh, uh, comparatively to the sub-Saharan African uh, experience, uh, very low cost drilling, locally available, where the supply chains, whether you're talking about the uh, casings used in the construction of the well, uh, some of the pumping mechanisms, all of these are, uh, well, they're, the, the supply chains are short, locally available um, um, uh, and, uh, and accessible. If there are problems, uh, uh, the, the comparatively low cost interventions and solutions. The other thing uh, to recognize is that, in, in, in particularly in alluvial systems, uh, very high success rates in achieving the requisite yields that you would require to, uh, uh, for this kind of activity. Um, and, in, and in a way, this kind of promotes the sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the scaling up and the, and the development of groundwater fed irrigation. Just looking at the um, uh, plot on the screen, where uh, I'm more familiar with the, si the context in Bangladesh, where you, again, s somewhat similar to uh, the Indian experience, where in the 1970s you're looking at effectively uh, al almost no groundwater f fed irrigation by shallow groundwater systems. Uh, when I say shallow in Bangladesh, I'm, I'm talking about less than 150 meters in depth. Um, but again, that's because the wells can be drilled comparatively uh, 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 cheaply and inexpensively, or cheaply and, and, and easily. Um, but what you see is uh, uh, 20, 30 years later, 3 million hectares in uh, Bangladesh is being irrigated by uh, quite accessible shallow groundwater. And this has had a huge impact on, um, uh, in this case, on dry season burrow rice production. And now, of course, Bangladesh is uh, one in the top five, I believe, producers globally of rice and is, is self-sufficient in, in rice in a way that it, it, it clearly wasn't uh, in, in the past. And one way to look at this, the important thing when you talk about sustainability is that in ma many of these systems, they're actually quite well um, uh, sustained by uh, recharge from the Asian monsoon. But that's an, an important clarification. This is in places. Of course, um, there's a notion of the Ganges water machine, and maybe just to, does this, uh, anyway, I'll, I can point to it, can't I? I don't need a pointer. Um, um, just to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about with this uh, Ganges water machine, if you, this is uh, 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 just as an example, well hydrograph in, in, uh, in, Bang in um, uh, central Bangladesh, where you see the 1974 uh, hydrograph to the, to the left here, and which there is a sort of annual fluctuation of a couple of meters perhaps between the dry season on the monsoon. This is pre groundwater fed irrigation. And now you can see uh, uh, kind of, not post, but uh, uh, post development of the infrastructure for groundwater fed ir uh, irrigation. And you can see, of course, that um, very substantial um, uh, drawdowns in the, uh, uh, in the aquifer system itself, upwards of eight meters. And that much of this is then um, replenished in, uh, uh, during the uh, monsoon and you can see the, uh, the, the uh, and this is in essence what uh, was talked about 30 or 40 years ago in discussing something known as the Ganges water machine. The idea that rather than building a dam, okay, that you improve storage by in essence drawing down that aquifer system, drawing from the groundwater storage and then allowing that to be replenished during the monsoon. Now, the, one of the key qu questions is that, that hydrograph is kind of a, uh, uh, is not the situation in many locations. Um, uh, not many, in, in some locations. And in Bangladesh, for, as an example, um, this is not w uh, w uh, what, this regime is not what occurs in areas that are overlain by fine-grained clay or silt um, uh, geology, which inhibits the recharge. And therefore, actually, net speaking, Bangladesh itself is undergoing, is, un is uh, experiencing groundwater depletion of about a cubic kilometer a year. Um, so even though there is a very, uh, in many parts of, of Bangladesh, there is a, um, uh, a renewable resource that can be relied on and, 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 uh, and, and active development of, this, of the groundwater to sustain irrigation, uh, we still have problems of uh, depletion in areas where uh, recharge isn't uh, especially great during, in, or is inhibited uh, during the monsoon season by, uh, by geology, by surface geology. Um, and of course, I, one of the other things I want to just 
point out is that it's a renewable resource here, but of course any renewable resources, if you move to uh, over abstraction or excessive use of that resource, then of course you, uh, you can enjoy depletion. Now, now just to, to, to relate this to the um, uh, situation in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're talking about systems, and I was focusing on the alluvial systems, and it's much more insightful, actually, to, to look more closely at the situation of the hard rock aquifers in, in, in peninsular India. But just now to, to make this connection to sub-Saharan Africa, this is some of the work, again, uh, that was published last year, led by Alan McDonald at the, uh, at the BGS, where we're looking at aquifer yields. And if we look at the map uh, uh, here, what you can see is that the yields to support that kind of intensive irrigation and even in, in, for the Boro rice cultivation in Bangladesh, you're talking about uh, pumping systems, pumping about 10 liters, 10 to 15 liters per second to sustain the Boro rice production during the, the, uh, 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 during the dry season. And what you can see is that there, there, with, uh, um, there are only a few aquifer systems in, in Africa that <coughs> might sustain that kind of uh, abstraction. And that if we look just as an example, uh, so the first point really is that aquifers and enabling such high well yields are comparatively limited in their spatial extent. And I believe this has been uh, said by others. Um, and uh, if we look as an example at the, uh, it's a sort of area in a kind of blue, I guess we'll call that blue, um, in the, uh, the blue area, which is uh, much of West Africa and Eastern Africa and Southern Africa, this is again this sort of hard rock systems which occupy about 40 to 45 percent of southern uh, uh, of sub-Saharan Africa. The well yields are basically much lower, and more than and and, and uh, perhaps as important that they're lower. They're highly variable. As a, as a, someone investing, even if you're going to invest in a well in this in this type of terrain, you don't know what kind of uh, well yield you may uh, you, uh, you may enjoy, and that. Uh, again, uh, it is a, acts as a constraint not only on, on uh, developing the roast, but if you think of it from a kind of business model and investing in the resource. Um, to get back to the question of, uh, of recharge, I'm just going to present two hydrographs um, to give you some uh, idea. We don't have a great deal of data, as Alan McDonald highlighted earlier. Um, this is not particularly good, but this is uh, uh, about a 15-year uh, hydrograph from northern Uganda. Um, where uh, you see that actually in this seasonally humid area of Uganda, that um, uh, recharge occurs on a near annual basis associated with it's a bimodal system in northern Uganda, and recharge basically occurs every year. Um, and or, or there is a very consistent uh, uh, replenishment of the aquifer under these sort of humid conditions. This is hard rock system and... Uh, um, now, if we uh, move to a, a slide that Alan was uh, uh, mentioned earlier, if we move, this is a semi-arid hard rock system in central Tanzania, and this is now a near 60-year record uh, of groundwater levels. And one of the things that's important, there's two important thing caveats I should point out with this just to begin with. This, as John Chilton highlighted earlier, is actually a very active well field. Uh, pumping a water supply to uh, Dodoma, and it's one of the re because it's a strategic resource. Um, uh, it's one of the reasons it's been very, it's been comparatively very well monitored. But there's a couple of things that come out that it's important that come out of this hydrograph, which for uh, those of you who are not uh, um, uh, physical hydrogeologists in the room, I, I, it's worth pointing out. There is a period in the 1970s and again in the 1990s where you go many years, multi-annual recessions. So basically what I'm trying to point out here is from the hydrograph record, it's n in, uh, in semi-arid uh, locations, it may be that you only have recharge taking place one year out of five. And under those, kind of situa under those type of uh, conditions, the storage, the interannual storage that the aquifer is able to sustain becomes extremely important. Um, another point, just uh, there was a question earlier in the, in the day about intensity, rainfall intensity. This is a plot from the Makutapora well field showing the relationship between uh, seasonal rainfall and seasonal recharge. And an important thing to recognize in this is this non-linearity in this relationship between rainfall and recharge. Essentially, in this area, you can have many, many years where no recharge takes place. But then you have years of uh, anonymously heavy rainfall in which recharge becomes very substantial. If you look at the uh, plot, uh, the dot in the top right corner, this actually refers to uh, the 97-98 El Nino when uh, the, um, 
uh, the well field was uh, in, a, in a space of four to five months, um, uh, uh, the water level rose in the well field in the order of eight meters. And essentially, that episodic recharge, okay, occurring on average about once every five years, um, uh, that was able to uh, essentially, over a five month period, top up the aquifer and, um, and, and continue to sustain uh, groundwater um, uh, uh, abstraction to supply the city of Dodoma. What I'm I guess what I wanted to point out in, uh, just in this uh, slide is this becomes actually a difficult resource to manage. If it's, o if it's only being replenished uh, comparatively episodically, and you are relying on, relying on this for a source of um, uh, uh, irrigation, you need to think it, it becomes a difficult resource essentially uh, uh, to manage. You may have several years in succession where groundwater levels are depleting before they, uh, uh, before they respond. But if you look over longer periods of time, you can see um, that uh, this abstraction, okay, for many years in the 1970s and 1990s, it looked like the well field abstraction was entirely unsustainable. And then one extreme event, uh, when I say one extreme event, I don't mean an individual rainfall, but a particularly heavy season of rainfall was able to replenish this. That's only possible in systems with substantial or, uh, groundwater storage. What about the systems where the groundwater storage is less? And again, one of our big concerns is, particularly in hard rock systems, the exploitable groundwater storage is highly variable. And at the moment, we really don't have a strong handle on this. Traditionally, in hard rock terrain, in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, drilling has been done using uh, 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 machine rigs. In this case, it's an air rotary uh, uh, rig here. And um, uh, drilling a well in this environment is particularly expensive. In the order, as Island was hitting, in the order of 5,000 pounds for uh, uh, this kind of well. Prohibitively expensive in the notion we were talking about, about small-scale farmers driving a, uh, a green revolution. Um, another problem associated with it is that there are very long supply chains. The casings, for instance, that you see in that, uh, uh, on the ground in that have come from India. They haven't come from uh, anywhere locally. Uh, uh, there is now, I believe, a, a casing manufacturer in, in Uganda, but for a long time that was not the case. And uh, so well construction costs uh, remain very high. Um, uh, you know, as a joke, 20 years ago when I was working in Uganda, I knew the names of all the drillers in Uganda. Okay, you can't imagine, uh, you can now imagine, of course, that that's about half a dozen people drilling or companies drilling across the entire country. It's changed uh, since then, and there are a lot more people engaged in, in groundwater development. But I'm just trying to give you an idea of the uh, scale compared to, for instance, there being a, uh, uh, m several uh, drilling companies in every Thana in, in Bangladesh, in every uh, kind of sub-county. Um, there has been some promise here, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say there's a number of uh, kind of low-cost hand drilling technologies that are making, uh, that are making some progress. And uh, uh, um, this is just a couple of the, uh, this is not a Vonda rig for those of you who uh, may be familiar with that. In the upper photo, we're looking at a, a rig designed by a group called Water 4. And, um, and they've got made tremendous strides in, in, in improving uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the drilling, low cost drilling technology. So you're looking at wells that are uh, comparatively low cost in the, in the order I said before of uh, about a thousand pounds, and the reason that they haven't come down lower than a thousand pounds is again that problem of the supply chain. Where where do you get your pipes from? Where do you get your pumps from? Um, but here's the point, and, and I'm trying to pick up a little bit on what Bruce uh, uh, was saying earlier. And um, these these systems, shallow wells in hard rock terrain, are never going to give you high yields. They're not going to give you ten liters per second that we are seeing uh, in shallow groundwater systems, particularly within the alluvial. Uh, uh, aquifers within, say, Bangladesh. Um, so you're going to get low yield, low well yields, uh, whether you like it or not. Although I've been, uh, one of the curious things um, is that uh, as more and more people seek to develop the hard rock uh, systems in places like Uganda and Tanzania, um, the experience is that they're beginning to realize uh, higher and higher yields. These um, uh, uh, better siting and more people drilling. It's b basically a bit of a sampling bias as you begin to drill more, you come across some of these higher yielding wells. But anyway, the main point being is largely it's, it's low intensity, low pumping rates, um, 
And one of the pro one of the, uh, the uh, issues associated with this is if if one minute, okay, um, this essentially becomes a kind of self-regulating resource, in the sense that if you are doing low-intensity abstraction and the aquifer itself is comparatively low transmissivity. If you overpump, you're largely going to injure yourself rather than engineering a neighbor. But one of the qu questions that I don't have an answer for, and actually remains an active area of research, is what might be the aggregating impact of very many multiple, or whatever, very many low intensity users? So I guess one of the thoughts here, just, and uh, many people have been saying the same thing, but one of the thoughts is maybe we should remove the image of the pivot of maize overlying a dolomite aquifer. Fine if you're sitting on top of a dolomite aquifer, but not if you're in a hard rock system. And uh, maybe one of the things to look at is, maybe we look at a green revolution that comprises distributed low intensity groundwater use among, among many other uh, potential sources. But uh, the idea here being small scale, small holder farming. And really to get back to what some people have been saying earlier, this is really about supplementing and regularizing what is predominantly rain-fed agriculture. We're not, uh, um, and, uh, um, but one of the, I guess the last point I'll just make is many questions remain, but one of the things I've tried to communicate in this very brief uh, chat is that we need to recognize some of the physical constraints, um, uh, physical limits of the groundwater resources that are defined by geology, climate, and land use. Um, in, in our vision of what we are thinking about in terms of uh, groundwater-fed uh, irrigation. Thank you.